Revelation chapter 2. I don't know how this message is going to come out. I didn't take a nap this afternoon. But I had an idea. I have to keep in mind for... Russ, Russ did. Uh, I have to keep in mind for the future is that if I don't have a nap, I was thinking about going down into the freezer and I think I still had a little thing of coffee ice cream that could give me a little boost. But I didn't do that today. So I I make no guarantees how the message is going to be. But I thought that's a great idea. I don't drink coffee. But, uh, you know, if I'm feeling a little tired, a little worn down, just go go to get that coffee ice cream for that little boost just to get through. Uh, But... uh, I actually will say I had a nice, uh, good night of sleep last night, but my chiropractor said that, uh, you know, he, he mentioned that public speaking, being up in front of people, puts stress and strain on the body and, uh, and on the neck and all those things so it can make you feel more tired. Because there's, I get a certain tired on Sunday afternoons that I don't get uh, any other time. And I was another pastor at the end of March when we were in Pennsylvania. Another pastor said the same thing. He says, you know, I get tired on Sunday afternoons as well. Well... And you're up speaking, you're up doing things, uh, it uh, tires you out. But, so I, haven't, I didn't get a nap and I didn't have any coffee ice cream. So who knows? We'll see. We'll see how things go. Uh, I, no, no, I'm, and I, I abstain from Red Bull. I abstain from Red Bull. Uh, there's, a, there's a spiritual connection energy drink somehow. <laughs> An open door that gets uh, portals, I think. Um, but... Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, well, I'll, I'll read the scripture, but um, I was just going to say, the, the uh, friend of mine from out in Iowa, he posted on Facebook actually a few, uh, maybe a month or so ago, that the God showed him he needed to give up energy drinks. And, uh, and I said, well, and he, he went into a little more, and I have to kind of look back at it, see if I could find it again. He went into a little more, and, but then I asked him to elaborate a little more, which was, you know, was a good answer. And he basically, and I saw this when I was out there with certain people, they would get dependent on energy drinks. And it was just something very much attachment they would get to their energy drinks that I thought was very strange. And uh, so he, 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 he realized uh, he was doing things to his body, putting things in his body, and getting dependent on something that he shouldn't. So it was an interesting uh, thought. And I asked him to elaborate, and he did. And, uh, okay, good. Good for him. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse, tw- uh, verse 18. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto you every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and um, which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come, and he that overcometh and keepeth my words, uh, works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter, Shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now tonight, uh, I could title the message a couple different things. One would be hold fast, uh, which I think uh, was also, you know, we really had that theme uh, in a previous week. But, um, but he tells them to, to hold fast till I come. 
And but uh, the the focus tonight, or would be the whole focus. Our focus is this church, the message of this church as a whole. But there's something glaring here that stands out uh, in verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And so this sufferest has to do with allowing or permitting. And so the message tonight is the permissive church, the permissive church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the wonderful messages of the church. Has helped us to take heed to these, to learn, to have them applied to our lives, to our own church, and pray that we bring you honor and glory and that you'd speak to every heart. Help us to have open, receptive hearts. Help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thyatira was a wealthy town in the region of Lydia. And it was known for its dyeing processes. And the Lydia that is mentioned in the Bible as a seller of purple was from here. Uh, we don't necessarily know. We don't see 100% uh, in Scripture a direct connection she had to the establishment of this church. Uh, but it is possible, it's very possible, that she had something to do with or uh, had some part in uh, uh, being a part of this church, maybe the founding of this church. Uh, the city had very sophisticated trade guilds. And there's a book that was written by uh, a man named J.T. Uh, Marlin, uh, the book Seven Churches of Asia Minor. Uh, these guilds were a source of great problems for the Christians. There were guilds for the workers in the various trades, like leather, wool and linen, metal, pottery, dyeing, dressmaking, baking, etc. At their various meetings, they would have a meal, and oftentimes the meat served had been offered to an idol, or they met in an idol temp uh, temple, and Christians could not engage in these practices. To refuse to belong to a guild in that day and age would be like a carpenter, a plumber, or a coal miner refusing to belong to his union today. Commercial existence was dependent upon one's belonging to a guild. And, uh, you know, there's similar challenges people are facing today with their matters of conscience. Uh, not exactly in the same way, but in the overall aspect of idolatry and other priorities, things that are a violation of conscience. What would you do if... You know, your, your business, your company uh, that you work for is requiring you to participate in something or support something that is a violation of your conscience. You say, well, you know, I'd have a hard time uh, taking part in this. And, um, or in this case, these guilds, uh, you know, you're trying to practice your trade, but the guilds themselves were involved in idolatry and, and, uh, and some uh, immoral things, the things that would be a violation of, of, the, uh, of the conscience of Christians not being able to engage in these practices would be in violation of Scripture, not just conscience, but Scripture. And so they think about that their, their business, their, uh, their, their livelihood, their ability to do their business was dependent on belonging to a guild. And so when you have that conflict, the guilds then practicing idolatry, then it creates a problem. Now, and today you look at the the, uh, the economy and the different segments of the economy and how much of the economy now uh, is, is based on things that I personally couldn't be a part of. Um, so one example, there's uh, someone uh, that my wife told me about who uh, moved, I think, from they were in Europe, maybe missionaries in Europe, not exactly sure, I don't remember all the details, but they moved back and I think she was in Maine and she's a nurse and she was in a in a uh, a, a hospital where they had some sort of um, psychological wing, but it was more connected to the ER. And so they would keep some of these people in the ER, these young, and there's a lot of young people in the ER uh, area that was a psych ward type of thing, and, but not, in, not a psych ward as we would think, more of like an inpatient psych ward. They would just be there for a few days. And, um, and she was re she's required... And, and what she's saying is she's seeing a lot of the transgender kids coming into the psychological section uh, and the psychiatric ward. And she's required to give them hormones. Now, from a Christian point of view, and this is my wife has said, you know, she's kept up her nursing license, but the but the likelihood of her being able to go back into 
the medical field in, in, a, in a hospital or in some setting. There, there are certain settings she could probably be all right, maybe. Uh, who knows when, if or when that time would come, we'd have to see. But she would have a hard time just going back into that hospital setting when you're required to take part in certain things. It's one thing to take care of a person like that. It's another thing to have an active part in the giving them of hormones and things that would be a complete violation of our conscience, our biblical beliefs. And to her, it wouldn't even be an option. Like, no, I'm just not going to be able to work at a place that where I'd be, I'd be more and, but more and more things are happening in the economy today, in society, in the job field, where there are uh, things that contradict, conflict. And what does that do? It makes it harder for people, God's people, to earn a living when there are so many of these areas that, uh, that are coming up. I, I wouldn't, uh, my conscience, I would not be able to be uh, you know, a cashier at a grocery store and then and it, that sells alcoholic beverages and be ringing up people's alcohol for them or cigarettes for them. And uh, it's a direct, be having a direct part in their transaction. And I know that uh, there was actually out in Iowa when I was in Bible college, there was one, one guy, one student there, he worked, in, he worked at Walmart, but uh, part of one of the things that was laid down, I don't know if this would fly today, but at that time apparently he was able to do this, that he would not ring up any customers that had alcohol. <laughs> and uh, so that was, you know, try, try doing that around here, you know. They did laugh you out of the store. But, um, uh, but anyway, that's what he had said. He had a conviction. He wasn't going to be a party to someone's uh, alcoholic uh, beverage transaction. And uh, so there are things like that based on uh, what's clearly stated in the Bible or based on people's conscience that, you know, I just can't be a party to this. And so the, they face that challenge there uh, in the economy with their, with their trades and their commercial existence being, being dependent on that. Now, the prophetic time period, as we've talked about, the, uh, each church has, uh, the, there's, the, there's an individual real church that existed back at those, in those days of, of the Apostle John. And we can also, as churches, learn from this. We can learn uh, as believers, uh, individual believers, from these messages of the churches. And there's also a prophetic time frame that I believe is, is significant. And uh, this would have run from about the late 500s uh, to about 1500, when Rome conquered much of the civilized world with soldiers and religion. There was a redefinition of the church. There was the replacement of the Jews. And those things took greater hold during that time period. Um, idolatry and fornication were a major part of the Catholic Church. And if you look at Catholic Church history now, you know, people are just uh, amazed and outraged at what, about the, the, the abuse scandal that took place, you know, that, that we still hear about once in a while. But particularly, it was especially in New England, this, all this abuse that took place over the years. And it came out a number of years ago, and there were settlements, and there were these different things. It's like, wow, this boy, this is just terrible of all of that's going on in the Catholic Church. The fact is that type of thing is a, an established part historically. I'm not slandering here. I'm not, I'm not um, committing libel or something. I'm just saying it's historically established that it is a part of the Catholic Church history. It's a historically established part of their history. The prostitution that would go on, the, uh, and apparently... One of the things I had read or, or seen in a documentary of some sort somewhere uh, that uh, they would, they had so-called outlawed prostitution, but it was actually, it was the people, the inner circle, the, the, the priests, the, the bishops and all those that were actually <laughs> partaking in the prostitution. So... It's, it's a long history of, of fornication and idolatry in the Catholic Church. Uh, it's nothing new. Goddess worship was turned into Mary worship. And uh, so those were the things. That time period, that prophetic time period would have been during that time when Rome was dominating politically and religiously in the civilized, much of the civilized world. We see Christ's introduction of himself in verse 18. He uh, introduces himself as these, uh, these things saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. So he's introduced, first of all, simply as the Son of God. He's not just a man and he shares his identity with no one. And so when idolatry 
is a big issue, Jesus is going to say, I'm the son of God. There's, there's no one beside me. There's no equal. Uh, when there's goddess worship that's going on, uh, there's no one that's beside me. And then prophetically speaking, related to the Catholic Church and the worship of Mary, Mary's not a co-redemptrix. No, a co-redemptress. She's not one who is, um, is a... Is, is somehow on the, almost on the level of deity with, with Jesus. She's not a perpetual virgin, uh, and she is not one to pray to. She's not an intercessor. She's just a woman that was used by God in a special way. And so he is the son of God. He wasn't just the son. He wasn't, he's not the son of a human man, uh, but he was born miraculously of a virgin, and she shares his identity of as God, with no other person. He's part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but no other person he shares his identity with. He's got eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. And some of these are what he was already introduced as earlier in chapter 1. We saw characteristics of Christ, uh, the appearance of Christ. Nothing can be hidden from the pure, undefiled judge. His eyes just pierce. His eyes, you can't as, as one commentator mentioned, you, know, you cannot pull the wool over his eyes because the eyes as a flame of fire will burn right through it. And he'll see. He sees the good and the bad. He sees the right and the wrong. And he is the pure, undefiled judge. In verse 19, we see what Christ knew about their works. As he says to all the churches, he says, I know thy works. I know thy works. He knows the works of all of his churches. But then we see a little more. He elaborates here. He says, I know thy works and charity and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. So here we see works mentioned a second time, because the first time is, is just the general, I know thy works, as he says to all the churches. But there is something about their works that he notices. But first he knows their charity. He knows their charity, that, that what they did, they, they apparently were a people of charity. They had love in their hearts, whether it was a love for the brethren, a love for the Lord, doing what they did out of love for the Lord. And so that was a good thing about them. And there are some things, this list here is a pretty impressive list that we can learn from, that any church should learn from and say, wow, these things need to be a part of our church life. That if Christ were to say, I know thy works, that he would list all these things after, after that. So their charity, commends them for their charity, commends them for their service. That's their ministry. So they were a ministering type of church. They stayed busy for the Lord. They wanted to serve. They wanted to, to do things for others, and especially to do things for the Lord. They wanted to get things done and minister to people. He knows their faith. You know, with, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And faith is the victory that overcomes the world. This is, as, or as the scripture says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Uh, so they were a church of faith, and they were a church of patience. And when you're faced with uh, tough times, uh, when you're faced with the challenges, the pressures, uh, patience, we need patience. And then we also just need patience to just run the race. As uh, the Bible says, run, let us run the race with patience. And that's, that's so important in the Christian life is that we run our race with patience. It's important for a church to run its race with patience. Now, patience just means, look, I'm not going to be going off into each direction, trying this new thing, that new thing. I'm just going to run the race with patience, knowing that you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel as far as what God wants in His churches. Just going to be patient. We're going to run the race with patience. Not pragmatism. Uh, someone, a uh, pastor friend of mine on, uh, that I've met just maybe once or twice, and uh, he, I'm connected with him on social media, and he was uh, on a little bit of a, someone put it as a soapbox, um, but, uh, uh, but about pragmatism, pragmatism as opposed to faith, and how that what we do needs to be underpinned by faith, that we have faith that we're obeying the Lord, doing the right thing, as opposed to pragmatism, and the way that pragmatism would be defined is basically the end justifies the means, that as long as we can reach this goal and this destination, it doesn't matter what we do, we can try all these different things. So ministry pragmatism. Well, when you have patience, you're not looking for the latest thing and what's going to work and just changing all these things. Uh, it's just we're going to just be obedient to the Lord. We're going to be faithful and we're going to be patient. We're going to keep on going forward to the, for the Lord. Run the race with patience. It's the Christian life and church life is not a, mar uh, is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It's a marathon. It's just and a marathon runner has to, to pace himself, pace herself, where a sprint you just... You go real fast as you can for a short period, but then you're done. You come to a complete stop. That's not how God wants us to operate, and that's not how He wants His churches to operate. 
Uh, he also commends him. He says, and thy works. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. And so they were working for the Lord. They were serving the Lord and they were even increasing in their zeal to serve the Lord. So the works you're doing now uh, are more than what you were doing first. And so they were increasing. I've, I've, I read a couple of uh, commentaries on Revelation and you know, there's different ideas of how this is... Uh, uh, how, what this is meant as far as thy works, it lasts to be more than the first. Um, some look at that as there was one that looked at that in more of a negative context that they were focused on their works as opposed to Christ's works. I tend to look, just look at the reading of this and say, I think he's commending them for their works and that the last is uh, to be more than the first, that they were increasing in their zeal. That's, that's the way I read this. And, but when you, especially when you come to Revelation, there are going to be numerous uh, uh, even from verse to verse, different views of interpretation of that. Uh, but th that's based on what uh, the, the pattern is uh, with the other churches when he says, I know thy works, and he's commending them. And then it says in verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. So it seems that he's giving the positives, and then he turns the corner to a negative. And so that's why I believe it's, it's just meant to be. They're, they've increased in their works, they've increased in their zeal, and that's uh, not usual for churches. Oftentimes, as the years go on, it's, it's, it's a real fight to keep up the, the zeal and the labor and the works, and, and, uh, and, and things can just, things kind of to fizzle out uh, unless there's a purposeful effort to keep pressing on for the Lord. But here, the last to be more than the first. Uh, in verse, but then in verse 20, we get to Christ's rebuke of the church. So notice, notice all of these things, as we just went through in verse 19, very good things. You would say, well, this is an impressive church. This is a church that Christ would be very pleased with. Uh, there's a lot of good things because these are not, this, this doesn't appear to be the external. This, this appears to be there's some right things in the heart of this church, in the heart of the people. Their, their faith, their charity, their service, their patience, their works. These are coming from the heart. Uh, not like Ephesus that had left, they, they had left their first love. And so, yes, they, they, ha they had a great zeal. Uh, they couldn't bear those which were evil. So they actually, Ephesus had something this church was, was lacking in, at least in part, which we're going to see here in just a moment. But the problem with Ephesus was they were, they, they were very zealous, but they had left their first love. They were not doing it with charity. They did not have a heart of service. It was more of, all right, we're going to take a real stand against evil and against uh, what, is, what is wrong, maybe false doctrine. But they were, there was something in the heart that was missing. But here in Thyatira, Thyatira it looks like, yeah, there's a real heart um, for the Lord, heart for service, a heart, they had a heart of faith and patience and charity. But there's something very serious here that even with these good characteristics that Christ says I, I know what you're like here I know these things about you and, and they're good things but he says notwithstanding I have a few things against thee and so we need to pay attention even with a, an impressive list uh, of things that are they're being commended for it's important for a church to pay attention to those things when he says okay I have a few things against thee to not just say, well, you know, we're good enough. We're good enough. We have these things, so we're good enough. That'll, that'll do. Um, my, uh, a friend of mine, I, I've kind of lost contact with him for the most part. He lives in Missouri now, and he's married, and I think they have a child. But uh, they, I went to college with him and, uh, in, in Iowa, and he was from Kansas. His family from Kansas, I believe. And... Uh, his, I think they used to have a, mot a hotel, if I remember correctly, and it was in a real small town, Kansas. And uh, from my understanding, I think if I remember correctly, the, the name of the hotel was It'll Do. It'll Do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, would, would you stay in a hotel called It'll Do? Well, it depends what the price is and depending, well, what we'll do. Um, well, is it clean enough? And it may not be that fancy, but it's clean. Well, it'll do for a night of sleep. Or, you know, or they only have one cockroach running around the room as opposed to ten cockroaches. Ah, it'll do. Just one cockroach isn't too bad. Uh, it'll do. But um, 
it'll do. Well, we should not have an attitude of it'll do for the churches. Uh, Jesus didn't have an attitude of it'll do, and, and neither should we as a church have an attitude of it'll do. And so it's important for a church to take heed to those things that Christ may have, might have against it. Uh, and here's what he says, because, in verse 20, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And so they, they allowed a Jezebel to be a bad influence. Now, most likely, you know, we, we know for sure this wasn't the Jezebel in the Old Testament, Ahab's wife. Most likely the woman's name was not Jezebel. He's just saying this is a Jezebel. This is someone who, if you know anything about Ahab's wife, this is the type of person that she is. And that's why he's calling her Jezebel. And this Jezebel was allowed to be a bad influence. So they were a permissive church. Even with all the good things they had going for it, they had a woman. It says, that woman, Jezebel. That woman, Jezebel. Now turn to 1 Kings chapter 21. We're going to see something about that woman. Um, and... Uh, 1 Kings chapter 21. Now, Jezebel was married to Ahab, King Ahab. I, I was pondering this, um, of who in modern history, modern day times, would I compare to an Ahab and a Jezebel? And uh, the, what's that? Were you answering my question? Do you have an idea? I have an opinion. You have an opinion. Well, I'll give you my opinion. We'll see if it's the same as your opinion. How about you say your opinion? No, no, no. No? no? All right. Okay. I'll just say my opinion. Um, my, the, 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 the couple that comes to mind is an Ahab and a Jezebel in modern history are Bill and Hillary Clinton. Is that her? Is that, okay. Well, we're, all, we're on the same page here. All right. <laughs> I'll say it. I said it. Uh, I didn't want to get excommunicated. No, 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 no. Um, maybe a slight difference in that, but a lot, so, such similarity when you look at it. I mean, the one slight difference was if you look at Bill, uh, it's very fascinating, his history, his, his, his background as a child and growing up, that he actually has a background in Baptist churches, Southern Baptist churches particularly, uh, and supposedly... Um, perhaps maybe even has a credible profession of faith that he's a believer. Uh, now, it, whatever churches he was in since then, and it sounds like he um, kind of got away from, from, from faith, from faith in Christ, or, or not faith in Christ as far as salvation, but, but just away from church and things like that. As he went along in life, he had kind of had a crisis of faith. But um, then he married Hillary, who was a Methodist. And, um, but uh, Hillary... The one with the pantsuit is the authoritative one. <laughs> Bill's just kind of, he's the one who likes to mess around, you know. Probably not, I'll be honest with you, Bill Clinton would probably be an interesting, maybe even enjoyable guy to go out to lunch with. I'd, I'd go out to lunch with Bill Clinton. He'd, he'd probably be an interesting guy, and it, you probably could have a good time going to lunch and conversing with Bill Clinton. I could just see that. Um, I couldn't see that with Hillary. But Hillary is the one who wrote the book, It Takes a Village. Uh, like, oh, it takes a village to raise your children, you know, communal type things and, you know, community. Like the community raises your children, not you as parents, but your community. It takes a village. You need all of society. Well, yeah, what if I don't like what the, what if I don't like the village? Um, so... Glad we're on the same page there. You know. <laughs> same mind here. But 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 17. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse uh, 17. 21, verse 17. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, the king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Now, I did not write the, this, uh, I guess I didn't put this reference down, but when, Eli when Ahab was initially made king. He had, he had married Jezebel, and she was the one he started worshiping false gods. He, he, he got into idolatry, and it was his influence, the influence of Jezebel. But this was after the story of Naboth and the vineyard, 
when Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard, it was next to the palace, next to his property, uh, but Naboth said no, and Jezebel's the one who came up with this whole thing that we're going to get this vineyard for you. Ahab's just there sulking and having a pity party, and Jezebel says, no, I'm going to do it. And she did some wicked things to get that uh, vineyard for Ahab. And the word of the Lord, verse 17, came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt say unto him, Thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. And this is where some of that comparison comes in with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton sold himself to work evil for the powers that be. Some of those things that Bill Clinton, he, he's, he's just kind of sly and, you know, what's the... What's the, what's the nickname for Bill Clinton? I'm, um, I don't remember now. Uh, Slick Willie or something like that. Is he called Slick Willie? Um, Crooked Hillary. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> Slick Willie and Crooked Hillary. All right. Uh, but he said, Thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Ahab had given himself over. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. So he's saying, look, your, your family line is going to be completely cut off. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel, him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Notice this, but there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. So Ahab, now we're not going to just blame Jezebel completely, just like we're not going to blame Hillary Clinton completely. Um, Bill Clinton's responsible for his own actions and his own heart and life. And Ahab was responsible for his own actions, his own heart and life, his own, his own idolatry, his own wickedness. But it says, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. Now, that's the opposite of what a wife is supposed to do. A wife should not be stirring her husband up to evil. A wife should be promoting good. A wife should be stirring her husband up to be provoking him to good. A good example and he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And so, so this, this is where we see the difference between Ahab and Jezebel. And what I envision being the difference between Bill and Hillary. I, should, I need to let the Bill and Hillary thing go. Uh, but... Uh, you get the picture. But that Ahab actually had a heart that was convicted by what message he was being given here. That, that there was actually something that did get to his heart, that he, he actually rent his clothes and put on sackcloth. He fasted, lay in sackcloth, and went softly. Notice verse 28, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? You aren't seeing that from Jezebel. You're not seeing that from Jezebel. I will not bring evil, because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring evil, the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. And so we see that Ahab actually had a change of heart right at the end, right near the end of his life. Now, the, what God said about his death and things, that there was, there was a price to pay for what happened with Naboth. But he did not cut off Ahab's family line in the days of Ahab. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. This is a very gruesome story. Jezebel's end was very gruesome. 
But she did not go out uh, the way that Ahab did with a bit of a repentant heart. 2 Kings chapter 9. Um, I was really struggling with what to uh, read of this other than the whole chapter. But uh, so let's start at verse 1. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Then take the box of oil and pour it on his head. And say, Thus saith the Lord, I have anointed thee king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and tarry not. So the young man, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said unto which of all us, uh, of, all, of all us, uh, which of all us? And he said to thee, O captain, and he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel's. And Jezebel had been responsible for the killing of the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab. And so we go on there. Actually, I was going to jump down here. Uh, Jor- Joram was the king at the time. He was Ahab's son. And let's uh, go down to verse 16. So Jehu rode in a chariot, went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. And there stood a watchman on the tower in Jezreel. And he spied the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take an horseman and send to meet them and let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman uh, told, saying, The messenger come to them, but he cometh not again. Then he sent out a second on horseback, which came to them and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, He even came unto them and cometh, he came even unto them and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. And Joram said, Make ready. So you see some. I, 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 Jehu himself was not a righteous man. He, he was not one, but, but God used him, because you'll, you'll see the problems with Jehu later if, if you read the account of his, uh, him being king. But God used Jehu in a certain way to exercise judgment on the house of Ahab. And I, I, so what I like about this picture I get in my mind when I see Jehu is he's a man on a mission. I mean, nobody is getting in his way. He's got a job to do, and let me tell you, it's not a pretty one. Uh, he is he is on he is a man on a mission. I mean, he's driving furiously. He's in that chariot, and he's uh, he's going down through, and he's he's just ready to go take care of business. So that, that's the picture I get when I'm reading this. It just jumps out. It comes alive in my mind. Today, uh, my sister um, uh, made a, a, a communicated on social media. She said. Uh, that she, she was noting how she and my dad were at my grandmother's house mowing the grass. And uh, my grandmother has a zero-turn mower and got a pretty big yard. And, um, and they had gone in. Both of them had mowed the grass. And, and uh, they, had gone, they went inside. And, and uh, my grandmother says, you know, I was wondering, who's that mowing out there? And she said, ah, that must be Allison. And she went over, looked out the window, and yep, sure enough, it was Allison. And you know, and both she and my dad were wondering, well, how did you know it was Allison? Like, you know, even for you know, 80, 80 years old, eighty something years old, you know, how did you? Know? Boy, you, you're pre- you're still pretty sharp. You know, she's pretty sharp. And so I just commented. I said, well, that's because you drive the mower like a maniac, and Dad doesn't. <laughs> that's how she knew it was you. She could hear that mower just probably flying around and. Well, that's Jehu. They, they, could, they could recognize Jehu's driving. They said, oh, yeah, he driveth furiously. It's, got, it's Jehu. He's, this is the way he drives. And um, the driving is like the driving of Jehu. He was <laughs> 
And Joram said, Make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Oh, they're on Naboth's old property. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And part of the reason I love this this account is some of the word, some of the statements that are made. Just profound, powerful statements when he says, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace, so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? And you want to talk about hitting square between the eyes, not mincing words. That is talking about just getting right to the point, hitting the mark. What peace? Is it peace, Jehu? What peace? As so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And you know, that's the same message for the world today. The world wants peace, peace, peace. And for God's people, we'd say, what peace is there when the, the whoredoms, the witchcraft, the fornication, the wickedness, the idolatry, all of these things, how can there be peace? How is there peace when all of this is in existence? That's because there will, and, and that's why there will be no true peace until the Prince of Peace rules and reigns. Then there'll be true peace because it'll be a, a righteous type of peace, a, a, a true peace that only comes from the Lord. And wickedness will be stamped out in his kingdom. And uh, Joram, in verse 23, And Joram turned, to his hands, turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Je Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms. And the arrow went out of his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, saith the Lord. And I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. And so then uh, Ahaziah, uh, he saw this, he, they uh, took care of uh, Ahaziah. And uh, then in verse 30, when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it and she painted her face. So she puts her makeup on or whatever they did to their eyebrows and try to make herself, her eyes look really attractive and bright. And she teared her head. So she got all of her, her hair done. She got her queenly garments on and she's she's there uh, looked out at a window and as Jehu entered in at the gate she said had Zimri peace who slew his master and I just I, I don't know why I just picture this with Jezebel had Zimri peace who slew his master and um, and he lifted up his face to the window and said who is on my side who once again getting right to the point here who is on my side who and there looked out to him two or three eunuchs, and he said, throw her down. Throw her down. Very gruesome end to Jezebel's life. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And uh, they couldn't find anything except the skull, the feet, and the palms of her hands because the dogs had eaten her. A very gruesome end to a very wicked woman's life. And so that was Jezebel. That was Jezebel. She was a bad influence. We see some things about her that even to her dying breath, her dying day, she was not going to repent. She was not going to relent. She called herself, uh, back in uh, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, I'm going to try to keep on moving here as we press on. Revelation chapter 2, this Jezebel, thou, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel... <clears throat> which calleth herself a prophetess. Notice she was not somebody ordained legitimately to the ministry. She was, a, she was called, she calleth herself a prophetess. Oh, God has spoken to me. And false religions have been started by self-proclaimed prophetesses, such as Ellen G. White, the Seventh-day Adventist, yes. Mary Baker Eddy, the Church, uh, the Church of Christ scientist, uh, and, and there are others. There are numerous false teachers who profess to be called to preach, such as Paula White, Joyce Meyer. They are called to preach. God didn't call them to preach. God didn't call them to pastor. I want to say, how do you know that? 
Don't, aren't, don't they preach the word? Well, kind of sometimes. Joyce Meyer can sometimes hold her own. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they're living in disobedience to God's word. They might have a few good things to say once in a while. Now, Paula White's just kind of weird, but uh, actually a lot weird. Um, but uh, Joyce Meyer, I mean, some people say, hey, I listen to Joyce Meyer because, I mean, think of, think of the good stuff she says about um, spiritual warfare and just um, the various things, her book. And, and, you know, someone lent me her book at one point, and it's like a lot of the stuff in there, I understand why people would listen to her, read her stuff. Her doctrine, she's still word of faith, you know, Pentecostal, charismatic type of stuff. But some of the things that she talks about regarding spiritual work, um, and uh, is, is you say, wow, you know. And, and I even heard one pastor say years ago, like saying, wow, you know, Joyce Meyer preaches stronger and harder than a lot of the men do. <laughs> that's a sad fact if that's the case. And it, sometimes it's the case. That doesn't legitimize her being a pastor. And so um, uh, there were many women found. There were women who founded many Pentecostal denominations. And so once again, the Bible is very clear as to who the pastors are supposed to be. It's supposed to be men, husband of one wife. The woman should not be usurping the the authority of the man uh, and teaching the men. Uh, they so those people are living in disobedience to God's word. But here she calls herself a prophetess. And you know, even my wife on the train ride on. Um, uh, on Monday, she got sitting next to somebody, a woman, who was telling her about her visions and dreams and all this stuff. And, you know, my wife couldn't get a word in edgewise. She can't get a word in edgewise. That's the way they are. It's the way they are. Hey, I got something to say. God gave me something. She taught and seduced God's servants to commit fornication and idolatry. So similar, we, we focused on Balaam last week. Uh, and and that was the same. It was the same thing. Balaam, fornication, and idolatry. Oh, it's okay. You're you can be. You're permitted to do this. But what did they do? So as she's there teaching and seducing God's servants to commit fornication, and idolatry. And so as good a, as good as this church was, as far as what Christ commended them for, they got a serious problem here. You got somebody in the church who's got there's some really bad stuff going on that's being taught and then seducing. God's servants. So she probably was a very convincing, seductive talker, someone who's very appealing, maybe attractive, maybe someone who was very convincing, and, and she's teaching, see, she's getting an influence, and then seducing God's servants. And notice, to teach and to seduce my servants. He didn't call her one of his servants. He says, she's seducing and teaching my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And what did they do? Well, the Bible says, Thou sufferest that woman. They tolerated her. They, they allowed her. They, they permitted her to operate that way in the church rather than properly dealing with her. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Romans 16, 17-18 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And so the, the uh, admonition here, the exhortation is, you need to deal with those who are causing the problems, deal with those who are bringing in the false doctrines, dealing with those who are with good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple. And it's a lot harder now than it used to be because it used to be someone would have to actually come into the church to try to deceive the hearts of the simple. Now all they got to do is set up a YouTube channel. That's all they got to do. How, as a pastor, how are the churches supposed to deal with all of that? Because you have no idea what people are watching. You have no idea what people are listening to. I can't, you, you couldn't make a list long enough to, to go down bit by bit and then to find out what each individual one, what their problem is. So it's, it's, there's multiplied challenges in that way, but we are still to do that we, as the best that we can, and especially no excuse when someone's actually coming into the church to be able to deal with it. There's only so much you can do what people are doing outside of the church as far as what they're watching and listening to uh, because you don't, know, you, know, you, you don't know all the ins and outs, but we can at least deal with it the best we can. 
But when someone comes in the church, then it, then it's supposed to be dealt with. I'm going to read um, another scripture here, Titus. If you want to turn there, you can, or else I'll just read it. But Titus chapter 1 and uh, verse 9, Titus chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible says, Holding fast the faithful word uh, as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Now, this has to do with the pastor, the bishop. Uh, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. What was he? What was he told? What was Titus told? He said, "Those who are ordained as the pastors, as the bishops, they, this is what they must do. He must first hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. So he's got to grab on. He's got to be rooted in good doctrine, because then he's he's got to be able to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. There's people that are out for their own gain, their own benefit, and money. And I tell you what, a lot of those people." A lot of those people that are out there with these ministries, whether it's YouTube or on TV or otherwise, uh, a lot of those people are out for money and they just got to come up with new material from time to time with a new book or with a new series or whatever it is and they got to keep the business going. But the problem is they're trying to get money and at the same time they're peddling all this false teaching. And so the pastors are supposed to be in a position that says their mouths must be stopped. Our mouths must be stopped. Now, what's amazing here with Jezebel, she was given an opportunity to repent. Verse uh, 21, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. So this Jezebel woman, God actually gave her space to repent. We'd say, just, just do away with her. Be done with her. You know, God, just judge her. Be done with it. But he actually gave a person like that space to repent. So we no- notice God's mercy and grace even extended to this wicked woman. Even this wicked woman. That God gives people space to repent. But if they don't, she would face severe consequences. Behold, I will cast her. It says, and she repented not. He said, I, mean, I gave her a chance. There was an opportunity for her to get things right. And that should be our heart. If someone, even, if someone comes into the church and it's not just, oh, yeah, we're cutting you off and you're, you're, you're done with without give, giving you an opportunity to repent. Yeah, you can repent. Give you an opportunity to repent. We want, we want that. We want people to repent. God gave her space to repent. But there comes a point, it says, and she repented not. All right, she made her choice, and someone makes their choice, say, all right, that's it. That's it. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. There's going to be some severe consequences, not just for her, but those that are with her, those that are taking part with her, except they repent of their deeds. Like they, these, people, these other people need to get right as well. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. You know, they weren't going to get away with it. She wasn't going to get away with it. And all the churches, so notice here we see a reference to all the churches, that there's going to be examples set in this church, and God's going to deal very, very seriously with this woman, with those who follow after her, those that are committing adultery with her, uh, and her children with death. And so... The, the, the lesson here is that there's very severe consequences that come with this type of sin and wickedness and, and immorality. And, but it says in verse, in verse 23, And I will give un, uh, unto every one of you according to your works. Every person is accountable to God for their works. And so, and we're going to see this here, that they were going to have to face the consequences for their deeds, for her teachings. But there was a group of faithful people who were not given any rebuke. Verse 24, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. So talking about this doctrine, you're talking about the doctrine of this Jezebel. I will put upon you none other burden. Now think about what a burden that would be that you already have on you if you've got that stuff going on in your church. 
That'd be a burden. There'd be a lot of burdens. There's burdens economically if they've had these idolatrous, uh, these, these trade guilds, uh, and they're facing those challenges economically because of what's going on in their city, uh, and then they're facing challenges in the church because they've got this. And I could imagine if there were those who weren't having a part of it, that it probably grieved them and burdened them, but they might not have been the people in the position to deal with it. Because the letters, these letters are unto the angel of the church. So it's the messenger, it's the leader of that church, the pastor of that church. And he's got to be the one to take the lead in dealing with it. But they weren't given any rebuke. He said, uh, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. They were encouraged to hold fast until Jesus comes. So there were some good things about this church. There was a group of people, they were faithful. They were not being a part of Jezebel's, this, this woman's tactics, teaching, seduction. Jezebel, and uh, the, I call her Jezebel, whatever her name was, but this, that, that woman, as it says, that woman, Jezebel, and those that were with her, those that were going along, those who allowed themselves to be seduced, they would give an account they would, they would receive according to their works, but so would the faithful. God was not going to judge the faithful or bring consequences on the faithful for the actions of the unfaithful or the immoral. Now, there's still consequences for those who are in a position where they need to deal with something, and they won't. But as far as they weren't going to, they, they didn't have a part of that, so they weren't going to face the same types of consequences and judgment. In the end of Christ's message to Thyatira has a prophetic view related to Christ's millennial kingdom. Verse uh, 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father. And I will give him the morning star. Morning star is Jesus Christ. He's the day star shining in our hearts. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And Revelation 19 talks about the uh, ruling with, with a rod of iron for sake of time. We aren't going to turn there. But this is speaking of the millennial kingdom of Christ. So, are we a church with charity, of service, of faith, of patience, of the works? Are we increasing in our zeal to serve the Lord? Are we increasing in those areas? And what is our attitude toward... I don't think we have, to my knowledge. We're small in the church, you know. It would be fairly evident if this were the case, but I don't think we have a that woman Jezebel in our church, <laughs> thankfully. But what is our attitude toward just not just something like this that's described in Revelation chapter 2 to Thyatira? What is our attitude overall toward error, toward worldliness, toward carnality? What is our overall attitude toward it? Are we a permissive church? Are we one that Jesus would say, Yeah, sufferest that woman Jezebel? Now, by God's grace and with God's leadership, I try to stay vigilant and deal with things that I know of that need to be dealt with as they arise. But we should not have, uh, we, we should be a, a caring church. We should be a welcoming church to people who are seeking, people who need the Lord, people who need to repent. But we should not be a permissive church of we tolerate it and we just pe allow people to just go on with their evil deeds particularly as it pertains someone who's trying to elevate themselves to a teacher status, a prophetess status in this case, and is having an undue influence in the church who should not. That's, really, that's where it gets really serious. That's what I look out for. I say, you know what? There are people who have maybe come in with baggage. They come in with this and that, and they've got this going on, and hopefully they'll get right with the Lord. Hopefully the Lord work in their hearts. It's when someone then starts to assert that influence and be a bad influence on people. That's when it gets a bit more. That's when my antennas go up. That's when my radar starts to, to start to swirl a bit and scan things a bit more when that starts to happen. Because we're, we're going to be a welcoming church, we're going to be a caring, we're going to be a, a church of charity, of service, of faith, of patience, of works, 
but we're not going to be a church that is permissive when it comes to people who are going to be, come in and be a bad influence. What are we? What are we? The, are we this church of Thyatira? Are we, do we share some characteristics? Or are there some things that we need to change uh, for the better? To say, you know, I wanna, we should be more of a church of, of what Christ commanded them for. Or is there anything we need to shift our thinking regarding what to rebuke them about? Let's be the church that Christ wants us to be learning from Thyatira, not be the, a church that is permissive when it comes to sin and error and immorality.